Hello, F Sharp Sydney. Um, I am Aaron Powell. Uh, if you've been to Altnet, you've possibly seen me speak before. I work for the lovely Redify as a senior consultant, and I'm I'm very much a web guy. Um, I predominantly write JavaScript. Um, I predominantly write JavaScript that looks kind of like this. Oh, and by the way, I've got a really awesome slide deck, as you've probably seen. Um, so. This was me attempting to implement the pipe forward operator from F-sharp in Sweet.js, which is a macro language on top of JavaScript that compiles down to JavaScript. So if you've ever wanted to try and implement pipe forward, it kind of looks like this. This unfortunately was only one level deep because then you're getting into recursive macros and my brain was starting to melt. But still, I could write JavaScript that kind of looked like that. Yay, <laughs> pipe forward operator. Um, for, you know, uh, it does all lexical binding. And that's kind of cool. I, I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm a JavaScript guy. Not, I'm not really an F-sharp guy. Uh, I'll talk more about F-sharp shortly, but JavaScript being a pseudo-functional language has a lot of the same niceties that we can get from F-sharp if it is in more of a, a dynamic approach. So obviously in this case, um, I'm doing some um, a partial application of functions, building up new functions based off of uh, bound input so I can then continue to rebind and rebind and eventually execute. And that generates JavaScript that looks like that. So that's that's how with JavaScript you would do something like pipe forward, which is or partial applications at the very least. So we're here to talk about F sharp. So I write really bad F sharp. That's <laughs> And that's why I'm here. I, I mean, this is kind of just a, it's, it's not really a talk that's going to have something that you're going to go away tomorrow and necessarily put into any F-sharp applications you're doing. It's, and that's why I called it yak shaving, because this is about some experiences that I had with F-sharp, how I started off with wanting to solve one problem and then diving all the way deep down into something completely unrelated to where I was starting with, um, but still having a hell of a lot of fun and writing interesting, if not necessarily practical F-sharp. So this is something that I wrote um, uh, last year because I wanted to be able to force HTTPS in um, ASP.NET applications. So I thought, well, I'm doing a C-sharp ASP.NET application on top of the Owen Katana stack. Why not write an F-sharp extension that will do forced HTTPS? Uh, this is where I learned that um, F-sharp doesn't support operator, uh, doesn't support method overloading like you do in C-sharp. That sucks. I, I, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. So for me, that is just a—it's a pain in the ass. Um, also, trying to make extension methods in F sharp that can be used by C sharp as C sharp extension methods, man, does that suck! Like I, I was in there trying to deal with like compiler errors that I was getting, and then I'm like, okay, cool, I've got something, but now it's really just a static. It's not an extension method. But if you've ever wanted to make an extension method in F sharp that can be used as an extension method in C sharp. You have to decorate it with um, these compiler service attributes, um, and then that takes care of doing like the, the this prefixing of the first argument to the method being the um, I app builder thing there. And that's kind of how you you would do something in F sharp that's designed to be used just within uh, C sharp. Um, I just put this one here because we were talking about it earlier. This is another thing I was doing with F sharp, kind of exploiting the fact that you can do um, slightly more lax Unicode support. I created this project called Disappointingly Attributed, so you can express how you feel about someone else's code using uh, CLR attributes. So <laughs> I've got a couple that work very well in C sharp to just represent the fact that you've come across that static helper class named utility that's in the namespace helpers that's in the project common. And you're just like, seriously guys? And you just got that depressed feeling about yourself. But with F-sharp, you can write really cool things like a table flip attribute. So you're just like, who's done this? Like, ah, oh, rage quit. And like stuff like that. It's, this really is of no benefit to anyone. I might have like one NuGet install. I should probably put in the project I'm working on here at the moment. My colleague who is in the audience would love that. I'm going to start decorating all his code. Um, so that's that's me, and that's me writing bad F sharp. I'm not going to show you the code for <laughs> code for that because it's not particularly interesting. And thanks Adam for deciding to open a new instance instead of going to the one I already had. So my journey with F sharp started back in 2010. 
uh, F sharp two days. Um, so it's it still it was still fairly early on. Uh, F sharp was very much an unknown language um, outside of probably the, the academic and Microsoft research space. But I came across it uh, being a JavaScript guy on a project called INJS. This is back when it was really cool, the DLR had just been released and everyone wanted to implement every possible dynamic language on top of the DLR because you need to be able to run everything ultimately on top of the CLR. So this guy was trying to write um, yeah, the a DLR implementation of JavaScript but he was writing it entirely in F-sharp. Uh, anyone that's done much research into F-sharp performance and stuff like that has probably read a blog post by this guy basically ripping F-sharp and one saying that it, it was the reason that INJS was slow and then all the people that actually know how to write F-sharp came back and rebutted him saying, actually your approach is completely flawed. So it, the way you've approached writing the code was never going to work. But I was looking at it and I found some issues and some edge cases that weren't working the way that I. Uh, they should have worked according to the JavaScript spec. So I was like, hey, let's go and contribute to this. And this is before I kind of knew there was F-sharp. So I'm like, sweet, let's go and contribute. I opened up the code and go, what the hell is this? I, <laughs> I have never, I, like, I'd never seen F-sharp at this point. So I was like, uh, I don't really know what I'm going to do here. Um, let's try and make something with F-sharp. So I will show you some of the first F-sharp code that I ever wrote. Um, it's still on my blog post, although the website doesn't actually exist anymore. Um, a colleague of mine had just at the, at the same time written a, a little application in, I think he wrote it in Python, uh, that what it would do is it would scrape your last 20 tweets or last 50 tweets or something like that, pull out the geocoding information, um, combine all of the tweets that had geocoded information, draw them into, uh, render a KML file, which is an XML file of geocoded locations, pass that to Google Maps so it was very easy to stalk you. Just think about what we're doing is we're using Twitter to be able to trace your, where you are in the world based off of your tweets. Then it's kind of like now a scary idea, the fact that I was geocoding my tweets and then made it really easy for someone to work out when I was at home so they could break in and steal all my shit. Uh, but I was like, hey, cool, I'm gonna write this in F sharp. So, uh, yeah, I need to generate an, an XML document that kind of looks like this, uh, dealing with JavaScript and then, so I'm doing web requests, pulling some stuff in. I learned about, you know, pipe forward operator, like back in 2010, I'm like, yeah, this is cool and like pipe forward and fun stuff like that and map reduce and all those really cool things that functional programmers think is awesome. Um, but it really started to get quite nasty, uh, particularly because we're dealing with XML. Um, um, I think there's a download link to the really bad code at, in its entirety. But what I basically learned from that is, so I started with wanting to fix some problems in a implementation of JavaScript on the DLR because it wasn't, I think it wasn't dealing with some math uh, stuff correctly. I wanted to fix that, so I ended up writing an XML generator. Uh, that's when I learned that writing XML from F# -sharp was really shit. Like that was just really unpleasant. Coming from a C# -sharp background, I had all these really nice things about um, uh, uh, implicit operators. Don't have that in F# -sharp. Um, That's why in the code, there's uh, I saw it just before. Yep, yeah, there's some bad zooming, uh, but I've got some things like uh, the double exclamation point. Uh, that is a custom operator that implements. Uh, that then wraps around the string to x, x name, I think it was, um, implement uh, implicit operator that C sharp would normally have, and yeah, that's like it, that's so not cool stuff to work with. All right, so I'm you know, writing operators, uh, but ultimately, like, back four years ago, there wasn't a lot of interest, at least not not in Australia. There wasn't an F sharp community like we've got now. Uh, I was working for Redify at the time. Uh, there wasn't really any interest in doing F sharp then because we just didn't have any need or projects for it. So ultimately it was just one of those things that kind of fell by the wayside. It, it wasn't a top priority. Last year, um, one of my colleagues started talking about F sharp. Talking about F sharp a lot. Like you just could not get this guy to shut up about F sharp. <laughs> I mean, I'm not gonna name names. That, I mean, it's not like it was George or anything like that. But basically like, F sharp was starting. To, it was starting to become interesting here. Like, there was the people were interested in F sharp, at least in Australia. People that I was working with, people that I knew from 
uh, events that I would go to were, were starting to, to get interested in, in this. So, I'll, okay, cool, well, maybe it's time to have a look at it again. In the few years in between, I've been playing around with uh, a DSL uh, on top of the CLR called Boo. Has anyone heard of or used Boo other than me and George? <laughs> so the, the idea of Boo is that it gives you uh, a very pluggable compiler. So you write whatever you want and that goes into the Boo compiler and it will attempt to compile it as valid Boo syntax. If it's not valid Boo syntax, it will try and shell out to your own uh, own classes and your own code paths. And if you still can't deal with it, then you get a compiler error. So you can plug in things when the AST is being built, when it's actually parsing the different tokens with inside of the original source code um, that you've given it, and allows you to do a, a lot of very interesting things, particularly when you're looking at writing a domain-specific language. This is what Boo was designed for. And that's always been very interesting to me, the, the idea of being able to write a or extend a language that doesn't do just what the language author needs it to do because you might have a specific use case. Uh, you might be building something like an order management system and you want to write your rules out in that, but expressing them as long mathematical equations is not necessarily maintainable because they're difficult to read. Um, you might want to be able to inject variables into those equations and those things can, uh, it makes the readability and the maintainability of it harder and harder. So this is why I've, I've always found DSLs very interesting. And this kind of leads me into what the meat of this presentation is about, which is type providers. The way that I look at a type provider is that to me looks like something that is very DSL-esque in, um, and just in F sharp. It allows you to write something that can be hooked into by the compiler to transform something to give you code that you can work with. Um, so I, I was like, okay, well, F sharp's interesting again. People are talking about it. It's the possibility that it might become more relevant in the kind of work that I'm doing day to day. So let's go ahead and try and build something. So I decided that I was going to take a content management system that I do a reason bit of uh, heckling and work with called Embraco. I would take the Azure message boss and I would make something that combines the two of them because, you know, go big or go home, really. Like, <laughs> let's take a CMS, let's take Azure, let's take message buses and let's put them all through F Sharp. So the first thing I realized when I wanted to work with a message bus is that I was probably going to need to be able to change the connection string. And what works on my laptop is not really going to be working in my production system if I was ever to deploy this to production. Or even I, I want to be able to work on this offline, so I want to just use the Windows message bus or the Azure message bus depending on uh, what context that I'm working in. So. I needed, a con I needed to be able to get to my connection string. So I was Googling around, how do I access the connection string from F sharp? I, I, sure, I can import system.configuration, I, I can get uh, the configuration manager dot connection strings, but it, that's like, that's so C sharp. Like, it, that, that API is just totally C sharp. And that's where I came across this project called F sharp dot configuration. So anyone, else come across F sharp configuration before. Uh, so this is a very nice project if you're working with different kind of configuration files. Uh, be that your app slash web config, uh, be that a ResX file, any files, YAML files, uh, that's what they offer out of the box is these different kinds of config file formats, they give you a type provider to work with them. So I was like, sweet, I've got one, it's, it does app settings until I found out that the app settings support uh, at least originally, it was only the app setting section of it and not the connection strings. Like, okay, cool, so I wanted a connection string and I can't get it from this. Let's fork it and patch it and add the connection string support myself. At this point, I've never written a type provider. I only have theoretical knowledge of what a type provider is from about five minute conversations with George and Hattie. Um, so I, I, I get what the point of them is, I just have no idea how they're doing it. Um, other than it's something that happens when I press build and it magic, magic happens. So, all right, cool. What's, what's the first thing you do is you fork your project and you open it up and it looks something like this. And uh, I'm in the wrong file. So yes, I'm a, I said, JavaScript C-sharp sort of developer. 
yeah this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me and uh, there's a lot of things that aren't syntax highlighted and that scares me it scares me a lot um, right so where do you start when you want to write a type provider that's that's what I was needing to do okay cool let's have a look at what it takes to type to write a type provider here is a sample type provider that you can download from MSDN um, it's not particularly exciting what it does if we come to test.fsx what it does is it generates a number of it has this property that exposes uh, oh, namespace I think is actually the namespace samples.type provider and then it generates a number of classes type 1 through to 100 um, awesome <laughs> that's super useful uh, you can pass it some data that I don't think it does anything with as a string but it's got a bunch of, uh, these things have a bunch of different properties on them uh, this instant props property it's got methods on it and stuff like that okay cool well, th this is a good starting point I mean this has generated something for me that is consumable from an F sharp project that is now code right so uh, with a type provider there's actually some precursing code that you need to include either in your project or I haven't found a NuGet package that you can start with yet um, all the sample code is kind of like hey yeah just like you just add this uh, I open this um, namespace I'm like where do I get that namespace from I don't know so I grab this code from their sample and just copy and paste it into mine first uh, the first and most important thing you have to do is um, you, you're creating a type it's that's what you're exposing out to the compiler and you have to attribute it to say that this is a type provider otherwise the compiler isn't going to know how to pick this up uh, the other thing you need to do um, I think it's down the bottom of this file uh, you need to say uh, this assembly is a type provider assembly um, and that tells Visual Studio or the compiler um, when you run it through uh, if you were to run it through the mono compiler or just um, fs.f. Uh, was fcs.exe whatever it is um, it, it knows that this is a type provider and that's what it's going to get out of this or at least there is going to be one or more type providers with inside of this particular assembly could be other code in there this is just an f sharp assembly it just happens to also contain type providers right so we create our type and this uh, this class is going to have um, an argument passed to it of type provider config um, I don't know what as this does. Someone in the audience might be able to tell me that. It scopes it. Cool, it scopes it. When you say this, it refers to all of your internal methods. Excellent. So, the, uh, yeah, because normally you would have underscore and stuff like that. I th yeah, I've so seen. you can do it there if you want to talk about everything. Or otherwise, when you do like member, you might see this dot or x dot the member name. Yep. So you don't have to do that. Cool. Okay, so that's what it does. Um, the next thing that they, all the samples recommend that you do is uh, you inherit from this type provider for namespaces. And this is the thing that comes from the code that I don't know the best origin for, um, which is this uh, definition file, which then rep then maps to the provider provided types.fs. Um, but this is uh, yeah, a, a base class that gives you a lot of helper methods for doing type provider implementation. You can, at least in theory, do a type, uh, type provider without these two extensions, but I think it will be a hell of a lot of work because it gives you nice ways to generate instance members, uh, properties, methods, constructors, all that kind of stuff. All right, so I've inherited. Next thing I need to do is I need to specify a namespace for the new types that I'm going to be generating to come from. Um, I could get them from the assembly that I'm using so that it kind of it generates types with inside of the assembly that I'm working with or I can make up my own namespace generally speaking it's gonna be easy to make up your own namespace uh, it also means that you're going to avoid creating collisions with namespaces and types that people have created inside of their other F sharp projects so here I've just set um, a literal which is the namespace name uh, I also want to access the assembly um, that I'm going to be modifying because what I'm doing is I'm doing code generation uh, and that's not as scary as it might sound. I've done code DOM in the past. That is a scary way to do code generation. Um, I've done uh, AST transforms with Boo, and that's really crazy. Uh, but that is actually fun because you can modify the IL at a whole bunch level, better level than you can do here. Like, 
generate you can generate members that have like a snowman as the member name and you can invoke them from anything or at least none of the implemented CLR languages at the moment but yeah you, reflection allows you to invoke snowman and pass in like whatever a carrot as an argument to it yeah but I digress so we need the assembly that we're going to be modifying so this is where we're generating a new type and going to be attaching it to and um, oh, that let mark one we'll come back to that in a moment but if I scroll right down to the bottom uh, the final thing that we have to do inside of this type is um, add the namespace uh, add the the namespace and the type that we've generated uh, to it so uh, to the assembly that we're working with that means that we've we've modified the assembly we've generated a new type we've added it it's exposed we can consume it with inside of our application so how do you how do you actually create these types that you're adding to the, your assembly that's this mark one provided type um, that's what this method is doing up here and let's scroll all the way back to the top uh, so they've created something that they, they just generate a, a sequence from uh, 1 to 100 so that they can generate a whole bunch of different uh, members on it first thing you do uh, we need to create a type definition so this is the, this is the actual class that you're going to be exposing or the the type um, if you're just exposing it for F sharp this is the, the type definition so assembly that it's going into the namespace of the type that you're generating and then the name of that type so you can like you can name this whatever you want um, I'm not sure what the F sharp Unicode support inside of strings is like but you could probably create snowman methods using this I just think snowman is a really cool little Unicode character that looks really awesome. Skull and crossbones. You can make a skull and crossbones method and uh, use that with your attribute for disappointment and like heavy dragons, like total heavy dragon stuff. And then the last thing you've got to do with the type that you're generating is give it a base type that you're going to be working with. So you can inherit from whatever you want. Uh, a lot of the time with a type provider, you're going to want to just inherit from object because you're generating something completely new and custom on the fly but if you wanted you could always inherit from um, like a struct or uh, if you wanted to inherit from uh, some more complex object that you had exposed you could always do that if you wanted to create a base type for multiple type providers that you're doing you could always inherit from those instead what about Yes, but I'm not sure about interface implementation. I've never tried to inherit, but there's no, there's nothing that would stop you from doing it. Um, it's just you might generate invalid IL, which means that you'll get compile errors trying to use your type provider. I've always theorized that you should also be able to use consume a type provider from a type provider because the type provider assembly is just an F-sharp assembly that's got to go through the compiler. So you could depend on another type provider. So you could have a type provider that is just wrapping another type provider seems reasonable I am well, as reasonable as you get uh, so our T that we get back is the type definition uh, from the type definition we have a whole bunch of different things that we can do uh, we can add members to it uh, I'm not quite sure the difference between add member and add member delayed we can add multiple members so if you if you're generating a sequence of, uh, of members um, you might want to add multiples at the same time you can add XML documents you can generate your new type that is immediately obsoleted <laughs> ah, yeah. Um, and yeah, so if, if anyone has done Code DOM, this is so much nicer than like if you've ever looked at Code DOM. It's like, sweet, I actually have clean methods for generating types and putting things on them, not having to do really weird things that then generate VB at the end. Uh, so, um, the, oh, the, the add XML doc delayed, and maybe that's what add member delay does, is it takes a um, a function that is then executed when the IntelliSense or when the compiler wants to pick that up. So in this case, um, they're obviously not wanting to generate the string up front. They're generating the string kind of as you did it. So you could always modify what n was if it was a mutable uh, property. And, you know, actually generate your XML document to uh, so your, your XML comments to be modified on usage. There's a bad idea if ever I heard one. <laughs> Um, we can create static properties. So the, the type that we've, we define, we can uh, pass in different arguments to it. So in this case here, we're creating a static property. Um, properties obviously have getters and setters. So we can provide some get code and we can provide setter code. 
This uses, um, uh, so you provide a function that you will be executing when the get or the set is invoked. And then that is, uh, let's see if I get the terminology correct, that's an F sharp, so that's with Q, quotation. Thank you, Troy. Um, I looked it up earlier and I was like, cool, I need to remember that one. Uh, so you, you create an F sharp quotation that is executed, um, which probably means something, I don't know what an F sharp quotation really is. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a link expression for, cool. Uh, you can generate constructors, sweet. I can make a constructor, I can create multiple constructors, obviously, I can create constructors with different arguments. I'm sure I could probably create constructors with the same arguments and add them to the type and just watch it all fall apart. Um, oh, here's another constructor that they've added, added um, documents to it, instant methods, properties, and then at the end, uh, what it does is it's generated a whole uh, like a list of types, um, and then we add those types to the namespace, and then we use it like so. Um, so the first thing you need to do is you need to import your uh, type provider. If you're using this, uh, if you're using a, like an F# -sharp project rather than just a script file like I'm doing here, you would add it as a, as a project reference. Uh, be aware that when you're running a type provider and you're using Visual Studio to test it, be it as, um, as just a script or you're doing an actual hard reference to it, uh, Visual Studio will, lock the, uh, will load the assembly in and then lock it so you can't recompile. You have to close Visual Studio and reopen it. This is why if you have a look at F-sharp configuration, and I'm assuming that the other type provider projects, they actually have two solution files, one which is for the type provider, the other which is for the usage of the type provider, and it is just a bitch to do any kind of modifications. Particularly, I still don't know how to debug a type provider. Like, think about it, this is something that I'm running at compile time, so I need to be debugging it as it goes through the compile. I meant to ask Don Simon when he was here last month, but didn't get to it. So. You write some code, you compile it, and then it doesn't work, and then you're like, close Visual Studio. Open Visual Studio, wait for the project to load, change the code, compile it, uh, run it, it still didn't work, close Visual Studio. Yeah, this, this was a really fun process. But still, you generate at the end of the day types that you can do things with, and it's all very exciting. All right, cool. So earlier today, I decided to make a type provider that is going to be the most useful type provider you're ever going to want with inside of your application. It's called the string type provider. And Sorry, how long before the presentation was this done? Uh, so at about quarter past five, I asked George to <laughs> review some of my F sharp code. So like I said, I did it just in time for the presentation. Do you, do you have unit tests? <laughs> how do you unit test something going through the compiler? I don't know. To be, to be honest, they actually don't have unit tests inside of F-sharp config, configuration, and that's something owned by the F-sharp open source project team on GitHub, so I don't care. They don't do it, so I don't do it. <laughs> why, why do I need unit tests? Yeah, like I said, you work out how to do that, more power to you. Okay, so I've created a, uh, a typed string in here, and I will now pass it. Uh, hello, F-sharp. Sydney, and there we go. So, if you haven't ever used a type provider, uh, this is how you do it. The first thing um, you do, or at least in this case, I'm generating a type based off of the type provider, not just generating an object from the type provider. So I'm, um, and this will compile down into a constructor, takes that string. So I generate a thing called foo, and then, ha, I was about to type var. <laughs> okay, so. I create a usage of my bar, and this is where you'll see my really awesome type provider in action. Look at that, so these are the members on it. So this is the space character. So I have a property of it <laughs> called space because I had a space in it. F, H, hello F-sharp Sydney. That's the property name, and I'll make some more comments off screen. The value you gave me to start with. So, so what I've done is I've taken that string and I've generated a type that's got one member for every character of that string. I've also added the actual full string sans spaces because you, you can create it with spaces if you really wanted. Um, you can create it with punctuation and all that kind of stuff. Send a snowman. Um, yeah, you can pass in snowman. Um, I actually don't know the Unicode character off the top of my head, sorry. Um, 
I created a length property, so this is how long the string is. S, D, they're not in alphabetical order, sorry. They're actually, um, they're actually in, uh, are they in alphabetical order? Yes, yes. Oh yeah, they are. Oh, it's, it's um, yeah, it's um, case sensitive, yeah, case as well. Okay, so, who wants to see how that awesome type provider would work? And you, you want to see the code that George wrote for me? <laughs> okay. I just pointed out. Yeah, the, the code that George pointed out I was, could have done differently. Uh, so, I'm creating a static property on, on the um, string type provider, which is called um, string type. So that's, that's kind of my starting point, which will then compile down into a constructor. Uh, the, uh, I'm also saying that it has a static value that needs to be passed in called value. So this is the initial string that we work with. So um, I can't remember if this actually compiles down to a constructor that you then pass it into or a constructor and then they assign a property called value. We'd have to look at the generated IL to um, work that one out. Uh, and then I am just doing a match and then saying, provided that there is uh, the parameters that have been passed to the static, provided that that is a string, then we can do something, otherwise it's just gonna fail fast. Um, so I've got to fail with at the end. Okay, so assuming that you pass me a string, I'm gonna create a uh, type definition, uh, which is going to be called uh, string typed. That's what the type name that gets passed in is. I'm gonna create a length property that's gonna be an instance member of that, that's gonna have a get, which is then gonna be called, uh, which is gonna be the String that you passed in its length. I didn't add an XML comment to this one. Uh, then I have got the the string that you've passed in. Pass that through a sequence map. In the sequence map, I generate a property that has a get uh, a getter on it, which is just the the, um, the character string. Uh, then create an XML doc. Add that. Turn that into a list. Add that set of members to my overarching um, type that I'm generating. I then sanitize the string, remove all the spaces, and create a property called that. If I removed that uh, value dot replace, then I would I would create a member, a property name that has spaces in it, which in F sharp would be perfectly valid. Uh, then finally, I'm generating a constructor that I copy and pasted from somewhere else, and I can't remember. Oh, that's right. I need to downcast the argument that's passed in to an object, so it can be passed into this uh, initialization function at the top. The initialization function is what's executed when your constructor is executed, I, I think, something like that. Um, and yeah, so if it downcasts it to an object, because that's what passing, and then I do my match to say if it's a string. And you can make this one deal with like if it's a string or if it's a number, actually generate two different types at the end of the day. But this is really what it takes to, to write a type provider. Um, the most common uses of a type provider, at least, where you're passing in something to initialize the information about the type provider. Be that the location of a configuration file that you want to use on disk, or your web config, your app config, your any file, your YAML file. Be a connection string to a database so that it can then query that database, pull back its schema, and then literally just iterate through the results of that schema query to then start building up types um, like, I would, like I was doing here, or like I was doing down further with the sequence map. That's that's the magic behind something like the F# data type provider that gen generates off it. Uh, the JSON one, we just convert the JSON into a, a simple key value pair and then take all the keys and create properties for each key. CSV, we read the headers and do stuff like that. So it's, it's actually really not that difficult in the scheme of code generation to create a type provider. It's all about parsing something that you start with a text file, a CSV file, uh, and then using the provided methods to generate properties or methods, constructors, statics, etc. Yep, question? Can you run the time and run it backwards? Pardon? Can I run it backwards? Because <laughs> uh, what no. you're doing is you take the data and you make your, turning it into... Um, yeah, into okay, the so the, the only way that I think you would do that is you're always going to have to start with a compiled instance of your type provider. Um, so if you like, if you accidentally deleted your database schema, but you'd compiled at some point based off of that schema, you could use reflection on the generated type, 
read back the schema information and then build your database back again. Um, the power of reflection would probably be the only way you can do it. So yeah, you, you could theoretically do schema generation based off of the previously generated schema from a type provider. Challenge for you. <laughs> Next month talk. Uh, so now let's go bar dot uh, hello f sharp. Let's run this and pop my f sharp interactive big. There we go. So it was hello f sharp Sydney value that I got passed in from the property that I generated on the fly based off of the value of that string. Um, and if I came back and yeah, change that to hello f sharp elsewhere. Oh, I shouldn't have hit compile. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. So, so changing that, that's now, like, that's now immediately invalid because the string that I passed in is no longer that. If I was to just remove the Sydney, just ignore that compiler error because I shouldn't have actually hit compile. There we go, elsewhere. So that's how you can generate a type provider based off of some very simple information you passed in. Now, back to the start of the story of how uh, we're creating a type provider or why we're creating a type provider. Uh, the one for f -sharp configuration with connection strings. This is kind of what it looks like uh, This from this letdown and everything in line with that is the generation of connection strings based off of um, the f -sharp, uh, sorry, your app config or your web config. So we have um, a configuration file, like the path to it on the disk, uh, the name of the configuration file, so app or web config, or if you've loaded up some other one during uh, through the uh, custom mapping or something like that. We generate a property. In this case, I know I want that property to be called connection strings. I want to always expose it as connection strings, and this is just going to be an object, uh, as we've seen, because again, I don't need to start from anywhere. The other interesting thing that we didn't see in my sample ones is you can set these hide object met uh, methods. So things like to string, um, get hash code equals stuff like that. Those I inherited from system dot object. You can actually suppress those with a type provider so that those don't get displayed. So you don't see those in your IntelliSense because I mean, it's it, that could be considered a leaky abstraction. So you can actually suppress those like you, the in the type that you generate. Um, there's another way you can generate types. They're called arrays types. Um, I think that they're in the provided types um, uh, uh, FSI and FS. Uh, an arrays type is a type that is based off of system.object that they have then gone through and deleted all the methods for you. Uh, so you don't have to hide, uh, uh, hide object members as well. Um, got some XML documents. I'm generating a hash set. This probably can be done better. I'd probably just use a map, uh, sequence map to go through the connection strings. But again, it's, it's something reasonably simple in terms of type um, generation where I'm grabbing the connection string name, its value. Um, so this nice name method uh, will remove spaces, punctuation, and characters that are invalid um, uh, member names. It also, I think it also does a diff with all previously generated member names, so you don't try and generate a member with two of, uh, with the same name twi uh, twice or multiple times, uh, because that, that would be invalid. You only ever get one of them added. Generate myself a property. In this case, you'll see that we've got both a getter and a setter. Um, so you can create uh, properties that have getters and setters. You can obviously have as complex a function as you want with inside of your set code. So if you wanted to generate something that then like implemented I notify property change under the hood, you could do that logic inside of your setter and your getter and stuff like that. Or even just to the point of you want to check was this value previously set and um, validation, those sorts of things. Uh, I'm just saying that this is a static property, adding some XML documentation. Um, and then also saying where this, um, like we're referencing back from the source file this came from. So if, if you're transforming one type of source code to another, you can do that with add definition location. So you say, go back and look here. Um, if you were doing the actual parsing of the file yourself, you wouldn't have to do one comma one. So it just says it's 
top of this file. You you could even give it to the point of line numbers. Like with the, I think the YAML and the any files they've got, it's like uh, this config property came from line five, uh, character 10, because that's how far indented it was. Kind of cool that you can like, you've got that full power of what you can generate from this very succinct API to work with. And really that, what is it? 17 lines of code, uh, 18 lines of code if you include the uh, return. That's what it takes to convert uh, configuration manager dot connection strings into an object with connection strings named of that property. That's that's really all it was. And then you can finish off with the usage of it uh, like ah uh, yes, enable the type provider. The usage then looks like that. So that's what that's what I ultimately wanted to get to, strongly typed representation of my connection string that I could access inside of my code. Um, whoops, did I have anything else? Um, no, that's that's kind of all that I wanted to talk about today, what it takes to, to write a type provider, a very simple type provider in terms of the, the string type provider, more complex one in terms of dealing with an existing API that you're going with. And, and now, that, now that I've understand how that works. I can see how they would do things that like, scrape um, the different REST APIs and generate schemas off that because really all it is is um, parse and generate um, and that really makes it sound super simple doesn't it? Thank you and questions.